Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Michael John. Uh, yeah, I'm a very recent uh, doctor, as Michael John mentioned, Professor Gorbin. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, uh, the play pump. And uh, let's go to my title. Um, as Michael John mentioned, I have a work on the show that's about this. I've also been uh, writing and studying about the play pump for the last four years. My supervisors in the audience, uh, this will be the umpteenth time she's heard me uh, talk about it. Um, uh, who else here has heard me talk about the play pump before? A couple of people, not that many, that's good. Matt, the cameraman, has heard me, he thinks, five times talking about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very briefly tell you the, the, the story of the play pump and describe what the problems with it uh, are, uh, and then I'm going to do a little bit of analysis of it. Um, I think it's interesting, Michael John, mentioning uh, the design field, that Cape Town's become design capital, because I think part of the story you'll hear is about how design can sometimes be more about the surfaces of things and not really about design that's for the user. It's quite, I think that, that can be a problem. So the play pump. The play pump is a, uh, a children's roundabout that pumps water. Uh, it pumps water to an elevated water tank. Um, and there are billboards on the water tank, and the billboards are rented out in order to raise money for the maintenance of the system. So this project uh, attracted a great deal of attention, uh, particularly because of this issue to do with maintenance. Technologies in the, in the developing world uh, suffer from uh, this issue of maintenance. If there isn't someone there to fix something when it breaks, uh, it can be a long time before it's repaired. So when, uh, when this project was proposed to fund the maintenance of a technology with advertising income, it, uh, it got a lot of interest from people like UNICEF, from organizations like UNICEF, for example. So this is the way the play pump works. Children play on the roundabout. It pumps water up to this uh, water tank, and then people can draw water from a tap, a tap nearby. So it was presented as uh, almost uh, something for nothing, uh, the idea of an essential good achieved without labor. So children's play would happen anyway, and water would, as a byproduct, uh, be generated, and then their community could collect water at the end of the day. So it's a very attractive uh, proposition. And um, in, the, in about 2006, 2005, 2006, this project, which began in South Africa in about 1995 and slowly built up a profile in South Africa, by the early 2000s, it really broke through internationally and got the funding of some major uh, organizations and the backing of some major organizations. So Play Pumps International was established by Steve and Jean Chase, who are the, uh, Steve Chase is the head of AOL. And they broke new ground in using the internet as uh, a way of funding projects in the developing world. They had all the experience of uh, starting and running um, uh, America Online, and they put that experience into fundraising online for the play pump. So thousands of people around Europe and America began to donate money to get these play pumps in the ground. Uh, another way in which audiences in, uh, or consumers in uh, Europe and America were able to support the play pump was through buying products like One Water. So One Water, the profits from One Water go to the play pump. And in fact, you can buy One Water here in Dublin. It costs 99 cents for a 500 ml bottle. You can get it at the Black Rock uh, Organic uh, store. Um, and uh, yeah, the profits from that go to the play pump. So I, I use this terminology in my research where I talk about audiences. Uh, so the audiences to the project are mainly in uh, the first world, Europe and America, and they're looking at the representations of this project. And then you have users on the ground who are the people actually using the technology. This shows the play pump at the, probably the height of its popularity when you have some famous faces uh, handing over a check to the play pump project. So this was a pledge of 16.4 million to the play pump made by Bill Clinton, uh, Laura Bush, and the Chasers. Uh, there was 10 million of that came from USAID and the rest from other sources. This was meant to be the start of a $60 million uh, contribution to the play pump that was intended to fund 4,000 play pumps to be installed across Africa, and this they claimed would reach 10 million people. So they calculate that every play pump can serve 2,500 uh, people. All was going well for the play pump, uh, and then uh, this article came out as the first article in the mainstream press to, uh, to critique the play pump. And what this journalist did, Andrew Chambers, is he questioned whether, this play, whether the play pump could possibly work as well as, uh, as it was meant to. And he, he did a very basic calculation to work out what the, what the problem was with the play pump. He, he uh, worked out what are the minimum water requirements for 2,500 people, what is the rate at which the pump is supposed to pump on the play pump? And so how many hours in every day would it take uh, to pump enough water for that size community? Uh, the answer he came up with was 27 hours a day. 
So it was clear that there's no way that children's play could uh, provide enough input to pump water for the communities that they were placed in. And that's just using the advertised claims for the play pump's capabilities. As a result, what you found is that adults were turning play pumps by hand. Now, this is a, an image from a report uh, that was done by the Mozambique government. Um, so at the end of a day's work, uh, almost, complete, almost always women uh, would come and there would be no water in the tank of the play pump, so they would have to turn the roundabout by hand. And the roundabout isn't designed to be uh, used in that way. It's not nearly as efficient as ordinary hand pumps. There's a hand pump on the exhibition upstairs, which you can uh, have a go on. And uh, that's what people are largely used to in these areas, is hand pumps. One of the reasons why the play pump doesn't work very well, doesn't pump water very well, is because uh, the pumping mechanism is concealed within the roundabout. So in order to achieve this appearance of children's play miraculously uh, producing this good, they had to hide the pump, and hiding it meant that the stroke length is very short, it doesn't pump water very well. So this is, this is a hand pump. This is the, the existing standard for providing water in much of the developing world. This is called the Zimbabwe bush pump. It's the main pump I looked at in my research. So you can see it's got a long handle on it. It's got a long stroke length. It's designed for children to use and adults to use. And this, is a, this is a table uh, that was produced in the uh, Mozambican government report that compared the play pump to the AfriDev hand pump, which was the standard before. Uh, when it says, uh, is it complying with national water policy, that's because the AfriDev pump is rated to supply around 250 people's water needs, and it can do that, whereas the play pump is rated to supply 2,500 people's water needs. You might ask where that figure comes from, 2,500 people. Well, uh, it, nobody knows. It's not clear where that figure comes from. It's just something that the manufacturers said that it could do, but there's, uh, there's no way that it can do that. Um, you'll also notice that... Uh, the AfriDev pump actually pumps water better, almost three times better than the play pump. That directly contradicts what the play pump manufacturers said when they were selling this uh, program to organizations. They said the play pump pumps water much better than a hand pump, which it doesn't. Uh, play pumps also cost about four to five times as much as hand pumps. They can't be maintained by the people who use them. They need specialist crews to come and fix them. So in all of these ways... Uh, the ordinary hand pump actually performs better and is cheaper than a play pump. So one of the questions you might start asking then is why were play pumps installed instead of hand pumps? And not only that, why were functioning hand pumps taken out of the ground and replaced by play pumps across, Mo across uh, Mozambique, which is, which is what uh, happened? Another problem with the play pump is that uh, the advertising-funded revenue model for maintenance turned out not to work because advertisers weren't interested in advertising to people who couldn't afford to buy their products. So uh, you'll see that most uh, billboards on play pumps are blank, and so there's no money coming in for maintenance. And uh, the organization has been very slow at responding to calls for maintenance. Also, another feature of the water tank uh, with these empty billboards is that uh, when the user goes to get a drink, because there's hardly ever water in the tank, they have to pump the water up to the level of the tank and then down again. So you introduce uh, another piece of labor for the users. And seeing as there's no advertising and there's no water in the tank, the tank really isn't serving any function for the user. And uh, I'll just leave this up for a, for, a, for a minute if you want to read it while I'm talking. But... Um, I isolated 10 main faults with the play pump, so there's plenty of them to do with the technical details, uh, some of them which we've uh, gone over. Um, there's some here which I haven't mentioned, uh, num point number eight, for example, which is that users weren't consulted before uh, installation of play pumps. Um, number nine, I've mentioned play pumps often replace hand pumps on existing boreholes, so users have a direct comparison between the hand pump they had before and the play pump that was put in instead. And the system is much more expensive, so you could put four or five pumps in the ground for one uh, play pump. So we might ask, like, whose needs is the play pump designed for? It's not designed for the needs of the users, and it didn't originate with them. It was originally an idea uh, a water engineer came up with in South Africa. As a novelty idea, he used to be uh, installing borehole pumps, and children would come and play and want to help him and work with his equipment, as children often do. So he designed this whimsical idea of a roundabout that children could uh, play on to pump water. Uh, and then he showed it at an agricultural fair, and an advertising executive, Trevor Field, saw it and immediately recognized the genius of this uh, device, which wasn't necessarily what it did for the user, but what an amazing image it made of children pumping and producing water. So 
Uh, this is just a, a, an interesting, this is just a little uh, diagram that a blogger in Malawi did where um, he's saying, what really is the problem with water supply? Uh, is it the up and down motion of the pump? Because that's what the play pump replaces. And obviously that isn't really the challenge in water supply. Um, so what the play pump does do really well, it communicates ideas, it communicates image. So child's play is a, a phrase that appears in headlines about the play pump frequently. Uh, you know, pumping water is as easy as child's play. And so you have a pre-existing metaphor in the English language which the play pump then fulfills. It's also often called the magic roundabout. Um, and there's a long history in Western fairy tales and mythology of objects that do your work for you. So salt grinders that produce salt or uh, magical axes or magical harps that play themselves. So I think there's deep seated cultural uh, ideas and attractions to the idea of an object that will do your work for you without labor. So the play pump was often called the magic roundabout. And that's Mickey Mouse from Fantasia with his uh, magic broom that does his work for him. Other ways in which I've analyzed the play pump are to say it, it looks a bit like a chindogu. A chindogu is a Japanese uh, hobby form. It's somewhere between art, design, and DIY hobby. Uh, this is an example of a, ch of a child's suit that has dusters on it so that your child can clean the floor while it moves around. Uh, you see, chindogu are really great. You should, you should look, there's, there's a couple of books out about them and there's websites. But um, uh, a chindogu is, is supposed to be a kind of a visual joke. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea a designer has and then realizes a few minutes later that actually, no, that actually wouldn't really work. It's not such a great idea. But what if I made this funny visual joke out of it? Uh, but unfortunately, the play pump isn't, didn't just remain at the level of a joke. It actually was rolled out for people who didn't have much say in how and what technology they, they could use. You could also call it a parafunctional object, that's one area I looked at in my research is into critical design. Uh, we've shown quite a few critical design works on our exhibitions. There, there are some in this exhibition now, in fact. Uh, critical design is an area where designers work a bit like artists. They make functional objects that are meant to communicate uh, social and political issues. This is an example of parafunction parafunctionality from real life. This is Jack Kevorkian with his suicide machine, the Thanatron. And the uh, academic uh, Tony Dunn sees this as, as an example of para parafunctionality in real life. So in other words, a designed object whose function itself acts as critique or sends a message. So the play pump, I think, is also a, in ways a parafunctional object who, where what it does in terms of what it communicates to other people is very compelling. What it actually does for the user is, uh, is less so. Or perhaps even an art object like Parasite. This is the work by Michael Rakowitz. It's a, a shelter for homeless people. Uh, which is uh, plugged onto the heating ducts of buildings, which inflates it and warms it. So it means that people, the homeless, have to stay in public. Uh, and this was, in this way, Michael Rakowitz was acting counter to city officials in Boston who wanted to remove homeless people from the streets. Uh, he, he made this object which meant them stay on the street, made them stay on the streets and remain visible in the public eye. So it's a kind of political campaign object. But he never intends this to be a solution to homelessness. So... Just broadening out from the play pump in the last few slides, um, I wrote my thesis not just on the play pump. The play pump was the, was the central case study, but I also wrote about the wider field that it's part of, which you could call design for development or design for the developing world. So the idea of these objects which are, which are designed largely in Europe and America, sometimes also in South Africa and places like that, uh, for people in the developing world to use. So the clockwork radio is a, is a design icon. It's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, the Hippo Roller is a rolling water barrel, and the Life Straw has won multiple design awards as well. They're all little objects that are very compelling in the way they're represented and what they appear to offer. They appear to offer to really change people's life circumstances. And I'm not saying that they're all necessarily as flawed as the play pump, but I think there's a risk that the play pump really highlights, which is when we design objects that look good to us here in the first world and appear to be very compelling, there's no guarantee that they actually do the work they're supposed to do on the ground. And the only way to really be sure is to work in, however one can from the ground up. And there's a lot of work in design to do with how you can co-design with users to achieve that. So, I mean, if you want evidence for how these objects are received in the first world, you have headlines like these, which was for the show Design for the Other 90% in New York, design that solves problems for the world's poor. Uh, the photograph they're illustrating it with actually is a prototype that had testing in one village and then never reached production, so it never, uh, it never really emerged into reality. 
So there's a kind of an irony in the combination of photograph and headline in this case. So the idea that one can solve problems that are very deep-seated with these little designed objects, I think, is a, is a misleading idea. So leading also, segueing into uh, Patrick's, uh, Patrick's area, the broader frame that I'm looking at now and that I would like to continue my research in um, is to do with looking at objects uh, that have audiences in the first world and users in the developing world and trying to work out what happens in those relationships, how you can have gaps in perception and gaps in function in that kind of situation. I should also probably qualify those terms first world and developing world. I mean, there are lots of different wor words you can use. Um, some people would still say third world as a kind of a radical gesture. Uh, some people would find first world as problematic because it implies that it's better than the other worlds. I kind of like this combination of words, but um, in a country like South Africa, you have combinations of first world and developing world in the same country, and you have that in a lot of uh, other so-called developing countries as well. So this isn't necessarily just about a geographical separation of north and south. It's more complex than that. I'm going to leave, leave you with a, a quote, which is by the participatory architect, uh, Nabil Hamdi. He wrote the book Small Change. And he's talking about a composting scheme in Thailand. And he says, while the idea was popular among the more well-off and championed by conservationists and sponsors, for the poorer people, the whole scheme looked more like a plot to get the municipality off the hook. Sorry, that should be off. To get the poor to do their jobs, like all the other participatory self-help projects they had heard about and seen. So indicating this gap of perception between something that's put forward as a, a progressive, eco-friendly uh, technology, but the people who are receiving it see it as the government negating their duty and ask why they get these kind of technologies where the rich areas still get to use the same technologies and use the same resources as they did before. And this is very much what uh, uh, Patrick's presentation will be about. So thank you very much. That's, that's really wonderful. We, we, had, uh, we had Ralph present that um, midway through the write-up, and it was so strong. It just had such a big effect on the Durban audiences. So I really thank you for uh, helping us innovate our thinking in Durban. And we particularly needed it when we began to explore sanitation. Now, there's not much sanitation in this exhibition. Maybe the next one will, will take up our bodily functions and where the shit goes, what we can do with our urine. I think one of the b basic questions is whether we'll have um, a, you know, we hear about peak oil. Well, we have a peak phosphorus problem, and we're going to need our urine. And Durban's, in fact, the innovator in trying to bring environment and the market together, but the society's rowdy. It's the most protest-rich country per person in the world, uh, in competition with China. So it's a very interesting place. And I moved to Durban about seven years ago and run the Center for Civil Society. And there's so many ways that those contradictions of the worst inequality of any major society in the world, we've overtaken Brazil since the end of apartheid, massive unemployment rising all the time. And yet, for some reason, our little city gets to host the COP 17. What's the COP? The Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Conference of Polluters, we say for short. And that's going to be a place where what is, what's going to be done about the climate crisis in this building here? I think I agree. Nothing. They're not going to do anything to solve the problem because they're bound up principally in trying to fix a market problem that is an externality. Greenhouse gases that come from normal daily life and market transactions with a market solution. So watch that space. You'll hear a lot about climate finance, revived carbon markets. And that's why I want to talk about how Durban has innovated in particularly the um, water sector and is widely recognized, but is basically facing the same contradictions that we saw with the play pump. I mean, there's so many amazing parallels when you try and bring a market and technological fix into a socially explosive situation. Um, and it's socially explosive, partly, you know the, this problem, and I'm sure Ireland's had its fair share, of economists. Um, I just came from the Dame Street, uh, occupied it. There's fantastic people there. And they really were cross about this kind of logic permeating your society and financial system. Uh, this is The Economist magazine saying that throughout history, water has been ill-governed and above all colossally underpriced. And the solution is to price it more sensibly. Water is special. Its provision and its use will respond to market signals. And as for getting water to poor people, 
treat water pretty much as a business like any other. So that sort of really exemplified the neoliberal market-based approach. And the World Bank thought about this in, uh, in its projects, its, its various uh, memos to its staff that we got hold of, insisted that the poor are willing and have the capacity to pay for services adapted to their needs. Poor performance of a public utility is based on repressed tariffs. So you've got to raise the price of water. The Kampala statement applies this to African municipal utilities. But particularly when they found South Africa was playing with the idea, maybe there should be some free basic water. The right to water is in the South African Constitution of 1996. They said very firmly, no, work is still needed. With some political leaders and some African governments, that was South Africa, a guy called Ronnie Castrols, the previous water minister, incidentally, hung around here quite a lot, Carter Osmal, he passed away a few months ago. I was a special advisor at one point. Um, work is still needed with these political leaders to move away from the concept of free water, ensure 100% recovery of operation and maintenance. So you see there's this neoliberal sense that anything can be commodified. Commodify the air and do carbon trading, and privatize the air and the water as well. So this is the context. But the problem is when you talk to Suez, Leonez de Zoe, or Thames Water or uh, Bechtel in the US, they're not making money out of poor people. It's very hard for them to break even and to make the kind of profits. And Suez found that out to its regret across the third world and in Argentina especially. When they defaulted in 2001, they were just basically kicked out and they couldn't get the profits back. And then Michelle Cam de Sou, former IMF managing director, Michelle Cam de Sou Commission said, well, this is a big problem. We need World Bank guarantees because our companies want to go in there and make money, but they can't. And that's why the other context is so interesting because water will be scarcer and as a result more expensive with climate change. And um, this isn't really just as you're, you know, it's very good to ask what's a, what's a real scarcity problem? What's socially constructed? What's, what's genuinely scientifically a a problem. And we do have in our three biggest cities, so you see Gauteng, Joburg in the middle, Durban down on the right, and uh, way at the bottom is Cape Town. We do have some genuine uh, water scarcity problems. Now, it's all class uh, bias, so this is the way hedonism looks. Has anyone been to South Africa? So you, you, you've seen these scenes if you've wandered in the, in the bourgeois zones of most rich uh, and, and uh, white South Africans. Go to the townships, it's a, it's a different story. It's an ugly story of people desperate and making illegal connections. And you see the slogan, destroy the meter, enjoy free water for all. So very, very tough struggles that were part and parcel of those water wars that some of them are described here, especially the, the struggle against the meters I'll come back to. Now, if we go to Durban and we ask, well, what's going on where those water inputs to households are too expensive? What about the outputs? You need water to flush your excrement away. Well. There is a sanitation belt. That's the part of Durban that's a little bit too far to be on a sewage grid. And so they're going to have to kind of find something on site. Usually it's a VIP well, or just you know, in the felt or in, a, in an ordinary um, latrine. But there's new, very important person, ventilated, improved pit latrine techniques. I won't go into them, but they've now failed because the city realizes they fill up after a couple of years and they can't get these sucking machines to draw them out. So as a result, a move is now made to self-help, that kind of participatory do-it-yourself solution that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the neoliberal state trying to withdraw expensive water it can't pay for. The problem is this is part and parcel also of, of discrimination, the way that Ralph put it. The rich aren't going to be faced with these new technologies. The poor are. And in a context where the, you know, the rich got access to water like those beaches and the poor uh, who were black, the rich who were white didn't, this is a problem. I could go on at length. I'm a political economist, and I just love the questions of pricing and redistributive models of how do you charge people. Right? And Durban has been a leader, and it was innovative in free basic water. We can do that if you'd like later. The most important thing to say, though, is that this is an incredibly important municipal water uh, delivery site, Durban uh, Water and Sanitation. Um, it's called Etiquini, so EWS, because of some of the innovations in um, not just the pricing, but in delivery. So here's Science Magazine featuring Durban's poor getting water services, National Geographic, the Dubai International Award, the Excellence in Innovation, Ford Foundation, Best Municipal Delivery. And now we got Bill Gates, who's really excited by what I'm going to show you, the urinary diversion, because Gates has blogged that 
that the um, Neil McLeod, who's the director of all of this Durban Water, has been for about 20 years, is a leader in thinking about how to improve sanitation for the poor. And the Gates Foundation opened up um, a uh, reinventing the toilet strategy. Uh, and of course, the toilet has been so crucial in lowering um, the morbidity, mortality rates, and in getting dignity. But for the Gates Foundation, writing last year, it's a, uh, in fact, in July, this, this report came out, um, a $3 million grant for eight universities. One of them is mine, uh, UKZN. It's not my unit. It's Pollution Research Group. They do very good work. And they're looking for ways to um, have an easily installable toilet that doesn't rely on water uh, or, or a sewage connection or power, five cents US per day. So this is what it is. We could go through all the beauties of these designs and how they appear like Sweden's or maybe not quite as nice as that, but you'll get a sense of really trying to take the water system out of toilets by separating feces, letting them dry, getting the urine out another way, and then even probably it'll start in a few years starting to offer about three, four euros a month if you fill up the one side of the urinary diversion with your urine because of that phosphorus shortage. We're going to buy this phosphorus from you. You get paid to pee. And here we've got what it looks like, but there's a problem. People aren't using them, and they're not using them properly, and they're not using them at all, and they're using them as storehouses, and there's a real concern that this is not a technological advance for society and environment, but a neoliberal loo. It's a loo that is basically a self-help way for the city to um, not go forward with its obligation to get the, the services to people. It's particularly um, troublesome because the water quality, as excrement does leak out, does flow out, does not, you know, it's in the felt, it's in pit latrines, and then it gets into the river systems. And that means we've got an exceptionally difficult problem in Durban. It's just 15 years, and in fact, it's across South Africa, of polluted water courses with E. coli. E. coli that should be 110 units per 100 milliliters. But in some of these rivers are over a million counts. And that's meant that as it flows to the beach, I think we have one surfer in the room from Durban, right? Anybody else? What do you get if you're surfing in E. coli? You get a runny tummy and you get earaches. My son is always complaining. And that's because we've lost our blue flag, our beautiful beach status as a world-class beach because there's so much E. coli that comes from these systems not working, even though they've put in 40,000 of them. Very quickly, if there's time, just Joburg, similar story deny people the water or make them pay first, the prepayment meter, um, or uh, this big contestation that you'll see discussed here in the, uh, in the lobby, uh, in, in, in the exhibition about a prepayment meter contested in the, in the Constitutional Court. We can go into the details, but the Constitutional Court ruled that, in fact, it is legal. I think in, in, um, in England, they've declared them illegal. I don't know what's the story in Ireland. It'd be nice to hear. Because it's a health risk. Um, now, here's another uh, innovative way to, to save water, is to put shallow sewers. And without going through each of the 17 steps, you can just imagine a, a woman at the end of the day is going to be basically you know, putting some gloves on and, and sticking her hand in an unclogging small, thin sewage pipes without much gravity that, that, are, that are just in the ground, put in cheaply by Suez, in this case, this is a French uh, company, that puts in the shallow sewers. And once again, it's a case where um, not by accident, but by design, the clogging of the system happens. The women apply their own me uh, labor power, and then water is saved, and the company can send more profits back to Paris. So these are the sorts of things that make it very difficult. The last couple of points. There is a solution in the system. The solution isn't working. It's called free basic water, and it's been sabotaged by the tariff curves adopted. Um, this is a promise that was made in the year 2000. All residents should get a free basic amount of water and other municipal services, sanitation. That way you could actually get flush toilets in across these urban areas. Because those who pay, who use more than the basic amounts, will pay more, and then you could redistribute. You'd have a cross-subsidy. That would be the sort of systemic solution. A universal entitlement, everybody gets that free basic, but if you're hedonistic, you have your swimming pool, your English garden, your big lawns, you wash your car all the time, big baths, well, you're going to be cross-subsidizing. And then hopefully you'll also be more environmentally conscious and not use so much water. Here's where it ran into difficulty. Um, the World Bank argued that if you do that, you're going to limit options with respect to tertiary providers. In particular, private connections are much harder to establish. So what they're saying is, once you start to decommodify water, your privatizers aren't going to want to come in and serve the 
you know, city and because they want money for each unit. Instead, if people aren't able to pay, you just need, quote, a credible threat of cutting service. And they said uh, in 1999 that their advice, market-related pricing, was instrumental in facilitating a radical revision in South Africa's approach. So what I'm trying to get at is the neoliberal context applied in a situation like that with a massive disconnection epidemic as a result where we have, what, 275,000 families, like one and a half million people a year, just being disconnected, um, even in a 2003 survey. We haven't had any more recent. Prices have gone up even more. Um, service delivery protests as a result. Just people are so furious. It's a very rowdy society. And this is where it ends. Instead of sorting out a system that is just and equal and environmentally sensitive, where someone like me, petty bourgeois academic, would also be using a urinary diversion toilet, we're just getting this differential power of what technology is being applied. And people basically are uh, using their urinary diversion toilets, many thousands of people. We don't have exact figures, but we are studying this as storehouses. Um, and they're putting in full flush systems instead. Or in the case of the meters, they just rip them out and have meters now are called something else when you see in Soweto a meter. Typically, the electricity or the pipes will be running underneath, and it's got a new name for those of you who are interested in technology and design. The meter is now called the statue. It just sits there. It doesn't do anything. Anyway, that gives you a taste of South Africa. We hope you'll come and visit and keep an eye on the, the conference of polluters because we're going to try and make the links between water, sanitation, climate, energy, and social justice. And those of you who know technology and how to apply it properly will be grateful because our people aren't really doing it yet. Thanks. Ralph, if you'd like to uh, help us out. Uh, so, thanks for that. So, um, uh, just in uh, starting the conversation, and I hope we'll have a lot of questions from the audience uh, about both of these presentations, which link together in interesting ways. One thing I was wondering, Patrick, was. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently in Ireland, actually, which is, uh, uh, strangely enough, a country which uh, suffers from water shortages. It's hard to believe, but uh, particularly in the last few days. But uh, we have, uh, you know, problems in Dublin in, in uh, you know, insufficient water and discussions around bringing water from the Shannon and so on. It's quite a controversial topic. And also there's discussions about bringing in various uh, kinds of water metering here. And I was wondering if you... you uh, what can we learn from the South African experience around water metering uh, as we look at uh, different approaches to that in Ireland? Well, a quick, quick answer uh, might be that there's a, um, a volumetric a metering challenge so that you can penalize people who use too much. Now, our people, people of my skin and class, are using too much. I don't think there's any debate about that. Mm. Our swimming pools and gardens and all. And so to get at some kind of balance and ecological sensitivity, sometimes that price signal works. So you could see a volumetric metering and such a high price mm. that the what we economists call the price elasticity. As the price goes up, we respond. Mm. The problem is we're so rich, generally, white South Africans and also a few black South Africans, that that effect of a price determination that when you pollute too much, you're going to pay and you should stop, doesn't actually affect us too much. It doesn't affect our pocketbooks. And the problem is on that metering, when it was double the price in Durban, the consumption by poor people dropped back so dramatically from 22,000 liters to 15,000 liters per household of poor South Africans in, in Durban, the, the major study, that this is, by the way, during a cholera epidemic, AIDS pandemic, diarrhea, all kinds of waterborne diseases, that we had that um, very, very good lesson, I think, in how using market signals isn't appropriate under those extreme conditions. I am gathering that you're also getting a bit of inequality in, in Ireland since uh, uh, the liberalization and, and, and all the rest of it. And it may be well that, that you're going to have to get into some sort of command and control or regulatory solution. That's the problem, of course, for climate as well. Will a carbon tax or a cap and trade system work? And I do think that um, the ultimate answer is going to be some democratically worked out process in which people who are really on those front lines of, of being disconnected from water, being forced to use urinary diversion 
toilets, I, and I'd like to use one too, but they're not given a choice, are the ones that are going to be in the, in the sort of citizens' councils and weighing the pros and cons. That would be the ideal form. And that just takes a, a major change in power, so the World Bank isn't the ones that are, I guess in your case, the IMF or the European Central Bank, uh, who have their hands on the decision-making. And that's a political problem, isn't it? It's how to mobilize people so that not just on the water and sanitation, not just on access to AIDS medicines, not just on the electricity price or what's happened to your bank account, but in the holistic way in which all of these processes are affecting us all, we get out of our silos and connect the dots and have a more general critique of, of the way things are done. Thank you. And perhaps one quick question before we open to the floor to Ralph. Hello, Ralph. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, what I'm wondering is, you know, you pre presented a very clear example of a particular problem, mm. uh, almost an optical problem in the, in the sense of a problem of how uh, something can be perceived to be a wonderful solution in, uh, from our perspective, but maybe turns out uh, on the ground and, in, and from the point of view of the users to not be an appropriate solution. Yeah. So uh, what I'm wondering uh, is, is that an intractable problem? Is that something which is absolute, which you know, we, we just have to live with? Uh, or are there ways that one could create virtuous feedback loops between uh, uh, users and designers uh, that could actually get us around that problem of what, what do you sometimes talk about is the, like this sort of membrane between mm. first world and developing world. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've once had the suggestion at a presentation that uh, they should install a security camera on every play pump and then uh, people would be able to log in from the first world and watch and see if people are really using it or not. So that's a, it's a bit of a fanciful suggestion, <laughs> but uh, I guess that would break that uh, barrier in some way. But... Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the feedback loop. I think um, there are all kinds of ways that, that you could tweak the PlayPump project to make it work better. And sometimes when I give presentations, people have ideas for how you could do that. I've, I, hard, I hardly ever get to that stage of, one, of thinking about how to improve the design because I, I feel I'm quite concerned with the fundamentally wrong aspects of it. And I think uh, in tune with some of what Patrick's been saying, I think the very fact that the play pump as a project is supported by Western consumption on the one on the one hand, and also by a profit making model, I think there's a lot of interest in profit uh, in development as a means of sustainability. <coughs> so if you have a project which generates profit, then the idea is you make that project sustainable. But as soon as you introduce profit, you introduce a way in which one group, uh, if they're more powerful than other groups within that system, will seek to take advantage of it in order to maximise their profit. So. Um, yeah, I think there's something fundamentally flawed about the relationships, the power relationships within the, the play pump project. But it, I suppose, fair enough, you don't necessarily want to redesign the play pump, but mm. what about addressing the design process in some way so that it gets around that problem? Is that possible? I, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I would definitely wouldn't say it's not possible. I think um, just to maybe to present an alternative model, uh, just mm. apart from that model where you require that feedback, like if you have projects that are funded by uh, people in the first world, then you need to have that feedback mm. from the developing world in order to make sure it works, works all right. But if you take a project like the Zimbabwe Bush Pump, uh, which is developed by the Zimbabwe government and is administered purely for the benefit of the people using it, then you have no need for that feedback because the motivations and the whole structure of the system uh, doesn't have that exact flaw. It could very well have other flaws, but not that one. Thanks. So now I'd like to open it up to the floor. Um, do we have any questions or comments inspired by uh, the two presentations this evening? Yes, we have somebody at the back, uh, and we actually, I think, do have m roving microphones, so if you can... Someone's on their way now. Yeah. You can just hold on a second and uh, wait for the mic. Hi there, thanks. Um, I just spent two years working in South Africa with an Irish NGO out there, and I saw a lot of the play pumps. We were working with schools, and just to comment about them, I found... Um, that apart from all the points you made, it also is based on the premise that children have a lot of playtime, which is something we have here in the West or the first world, and not something that children in South Africa have. It's certainly children in the poor schools, rural schools that I saw. Um, it just meant that apart from anything else, if they needed water, they, they had to go and play uh, when they had you know, five minutes to go fetch water, and it just seems like really arrogant of, I suppose, whatever, our world or whatever, to think that children can always have the luxury of going out and playing. Um, so, thank you. 
Uh, thank you. That's, that's great to hear some of your experience on the ground. Yeah, I think it, it is... Um, that it's always like a parody of play. You demand that people play, so people have to celebrate it whether, they're, uh, whether they are or not. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Ralph, for a very interesting presentations. A question to either of you or both of you. What, in your experience, would be good examples or one good example of something designed in the so-called first world and successfully implemented in the developing world in terms of either water or sanitation? I was gonna, if you hadn't said water and sanitation, I would have just said so quickly... AIDS medicines, those were designed in like New Jersey and Switzerland and these big companies, well, really in the NIH in Washington, Yale University, and then they were brought over at 15,000 euros a year. So how many Africans could buy them? Yeah, none. And so the innovation was to decommodify intellectual property rights and make those generically produced in Kampala or Harare or Midrand in Johannesburg. And now over a million South Africans and several million people are getting the AIDS medicines. And that transfer of technology, especially now we're talking the climate, we need to bring in wonderful technologies you've been developing in Europe, renewable energies and all. But now you're talking water. I think actually these struggles to get free basic water and water as a, as a human right, some of them were, were generated in social struggles in you know, Scandinavia or in, in California and places where over many, many years similar class struggles and access struggles. And I think actually this is such a universal argument that even last July, the United Nations, as reactionary as it can be these days, adopted the idea that water is a human right. And now the next big struggle, make natural rights and, and Mother Earth rights, also part and parcel of this argument. So you're not just lined up in, as we were, a more legalistic and consumption ban, but you connect water and, and uh, as a consumption, production, disposal problematic. And I think those are the kinds of traditions of, let me call it Western enlightened liberalism of rights that fuse with the politics, let me say Cochabamba, Bolivia, the first really great water war, where the struggles to make water um, part of a general buen vivir, better living, and to decommodify, in that case it was Bechtel, a big San Francisco company privatizing. These are struggles that are so universal. And I'm sure if you haven't had them in Ireland yet, I've just been tasting a little bit of the struggles against high finance out there at the Dame Street. It's a great place. I hope we all go out there now. And it is so evocative. And your lessons for the rest of us in how to contest the logic of the banker, the logic of the water privatizer, it's going to flow both ways. Yeah, if I, if I could just respond to Bruce uh, just briefly, is um, the, the example I know best, the uh, Zimbabwe bush pump, just to take it as an example. It was developed by a colonial water officer in the 1930s and uh, was the national pump of Rhodesia. And then after independence, it became the national hand pump of Zimbabwe. Uh, and it kept on being refined. So it started with colonial era technology and then as now, like in post-independent Zimbabwe, still used and still the standard. And I just think that general question, perhaps, about technology transfer and technology flow, I definitely wouldn't be arguing that it's... Um, it's wrong or inherently flawed to use technology developed in one place in another place. In fact, part of how I describe the problem with the play pump is that it specifically doesn't build on the, on the flow of knowledge around water and sanitation that's been built up over many decades. So, for example, when it comes to water standards about how much water each person needs per day and how many, how many people the pump can supply, if they were using the standards that had been developed over a very long time, they would have done a much better job of it. So, I think... Yeah, it's a very valuable, intrinsic part of human culture to share technology and to build on that knowledge. So definitely possible to do right. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Just a question to Patrick. In just coming back to the idea of privatization of water, can you maybe explain a bit more what was the role of the World Bank? You mentioned something about giving advice, but I mean, I know from the example in Bolivia that the deal was that the World Bank was going to, I suppose, um, give a kind of a loan. Or, I mean, I suppose it was not kind of a, a situation where you can just say, um, by accepting their, 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 their funding, you have to kind of comply. And I think in the example of Bolivia, it was the, the price, like they wanted to increase the price. I don't know if in South Africa it was the same, but could you maybe explain, in the case of the World Bank, there were some conditionalities. And then the last question I wanted to ask you is that in the case of um, Colombia and in Uruguay, they did something called a consultation to have water introduced as a human right in the Constitution. And 
I don't know if they were planning to do something similar in South Africa. I mean, it's by collecting a lot of signatures and you can maybe call a referendum on this. Thanks. I'll very quickly say that, that uh, and, and those of you interested in diffusion of scientific knowledge, you'll be cu you know, curious. The, the nickname of the World Bank that they gave themselves in uh, uh, the transition from apartheid to post-apartheid. I happened to work in Mandela's office a couple of times, so I saw it firsthand. The Knowledge Bank, the Knowledge Bank, so the World Bank said, okay, we'll collect all of the knowledge and the best practice will be, and this is already mid-1990s, water privatization. It started, in fact, at a very funny place, Dublin, where they had the 1992, uh, the first major conference in which water was declared an economic good. I think it was just after the Rio, uh, does anybody know that conference, 1992, Water here in Dublin? So Water is an Economic Good was pushed by a world banker. His name, by the way, is Ishmael Sarah Gelden. And Ishmael Sarah Gelden is now the director of the Alexandria uh, uh, Egypt Library, the famous bibliotheque uh, of Alexander. And he, um, he just got the Nelson Mandela Prize and did a big speech. It's called The Making of Social Justice. I mean, we couldn't believe the hypocrisy, the, the 1984 Orwellian sense. But what he argued, you might have heard this phrase, the, the wars of the, of the 20th century were largely about oil. The wars of the 21st century, largely about water. And it was in that sense of saying, because this is such a political terrain, how do we depoliticize it? And how do we, as the World Bank, go in and, and make a kind of, Jim Ferguson calls it an anti-politics machine out of the development? And that's when the commodification of water, and if you price it sensibly, of course, it'll be used at highest value. Maybe the rich people in a swimming pool, but that's the highest value. And at that point, you really get into the, the very logic of economics, which is whatever the market comes up with is the best determination, Pareto optimal. And I think that's the big problem with, with World Bank logic. And they've modified it a little bit because they've been pushed back so far. Argentina in, uh, with the big crisis, certainly Cochabamba, Johannesburg, Accra, Ghana, Jakarta, Indonesia, Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan. So there have been pushbacks against this water commodification. And that means you'll often hear them using, as Ishmael Sarah Gelden did, the word social justice. But, you know, it's a dull technique, and the South Africans do it very well. And the World Bank maybe has learned a bit. It's called talk left, but walk right. <laughs> Other questions from, from the room? Oh, just one at the back there, yeah. Thank you, that was uh, very interesting. I've never actually, I'd never heard of the water pump. Um, is, it, is the reason I haven't heard of it because it was a, it's kind of a slow failure? Or Do you mean the play pump? Sorry, the play pump. Is, is there a reason, um, apart from the fact that it's just kind of a slow failure, or is there any kind of other reason that it wouldn't have been uh, very widely known about? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a good question because uh, sometimes I give a presentation about the play pump and I say the play pump was hugely popular and it was got loads of media coverage all over the world and then who's heard of the play pump and then people are, no one's heard of the play pump. <laughs> so all I can say is that uh, you can document all of the places in which it's appeared. I mean, uh, one of the most influential ones is a PBS film that was made on the play pump in about 2003, 2004, National Geographic, BBC, New York Times. You can, you can track all the places the play pump has appeared including, like, say, editorials in the New, in the New York Times uh, promoting it. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone will, will have seen it. Um, it has fallen a bit out of the media eye now because the project, uh, the international backing for the project collapsed in 2006, but the company in South Africa is still producing them, and you can slowly start to see more articles appearing uh, about it. Yeah. yeah it was more Thanks. of a, its failures as opposed to its promotion. I mean, is there, is there any... Um, outcry really in, in the Western world about the degree of failure that's had. That's been. Um, uh, there's a there's a film you can watch called Troubled Water, which is the the PBS, PBS after they felt responsible for having promoted it the first time, so they followed up with another uh, another film which looked at the problems with the with the play pump and called it's called Troubled Water. So that's about the only document uh, that's that's out there that sort of really frames it critically. Um, I mean, I think it's something that's very that's interesting. It's how slippery it is. Uh, all the people, One Water, for example, is still for sale. Uh, they're resistant to any criticism. It's quite hard to form a really coherent, succinct critique of it uh, and to get it out there in such a way that it affects it, I, I guess. Uh, all, all I can say is it does seem to be, to be very slippery and very hard to stop because people want to believe it. I think that's one of the main things. They, want, they don't want to have to go back on their initial reaction, which is that this is a great idea. 
But I guess that's your mission in life, right? To, to get the yeah, word direct, out. direct people's <laughs> dreams, yeah. <laughs> Linda? Can I just go back to the title, Appropriate Technology, of, and would question, you guys Question then, mark. Yeah, question mark. Uh, are you saying then that technology can, always, can only ever be pulled and never pushed? And by that I mean that there is no appropriate technology that isn't kind of pulled by the user into existence. Because personally, I think a lot of things that are pushed end up in really exciting spaces, even though they may not originally be pushed in the right directions. But it sounds like you're completely advocating for you know, a no, pull only. Well, I'll, I'll, okay. Can you give us some examples of good push technology? Maybe just a... Seat belts? <laughs> <laughs> no. well, mobile course, phones? Yeah, maybe. mobile phones, of course, are the answer I'll give to, to everything. And uh, in a sense that there are lots of technologies that you know, um, there are things that people say, well, I don't need that. And then they go and turn them around and use them like um, um, uh, for, for many other things and for things that weren't intended in the first place. And if you adopted your approach, um, I think you could get into a situation where you're always saying, okay, I have to completely understand the user needs. It's all about user-centric design and there isn't uh, as much space. And in another way, I think you could argue that that is being uh, a lack of equality in terms of, um, the developing worlds that you know you can only push technology on one side and you can't on the other side. So, comments? Yeah, if I could start. Um, yeah, I think if if I'm framing your question, you're you're, you're also asking: Is there good? Can there be good top-down design, or does it always have to try and be generated from the user? Well, I think definitely there can be good top-down design, and um, I think that's part of what's really interesting about this whole area is that if somebody has the right mindsets and the right principles, the right ethics and intentions, it's possible that they can produce really good work from above, which, which is effective. But I think when you're talking about systems, that's why people are interested in systematic approaches. So they're trying to work out ways to incorporate the user because of the systematic, systemic problems within uh, doing it the other way around. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, I definitely wouldn't make any blank, blanket statements about not being able to uh, to do it from above, yeah. Except I don't think you necessarily, uh, you know, you could be doing it without those right eth ethical principles in the start, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, anything's I, possible. Might I add that it's really where, where Ralph opened our eyes so much that, oh, well, there are a lot of other interests at stake here, and this is a sort of philanthropic uh, gimmickry, or in the case I've tried to argue of urinary diversion, good idea in principle, but it's coming through a denial of water to poor people because the neoliberal project of pricing that water uh, isn't actually working for poor people. So don't give them the water, let them poo without any water. And that's this sort of other agenda that we want to deconstruct whenever we're looking. So if, if I were told uh, in my little middle class uh, you know, flat complex, Patrick, you're now going to be pooing into that side and peeing into that side. We're going to collect your poo and it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's pathogens die and we put some ash on and we're going to take your urine. And that's going to be told that I, I'm going to live in a flat complex where I don't have that choice, or I have solar on my roof. I think that's actually appropriate. Uh, in the conditions we're going to be under, extreme climate change, we will need a strong but hopefully very democratic state that will be able to help everybody, everybody make these major adjustments that we're going to need to make to survive as a, as a species and to keep the planet from overheating. So there will be a point where the technology push from top down will be terribly appropriate. If you introduce it with a market incentive in a rowdy society like South Africa, as I say, you're going to have some trouble. Uh, can, can I just ask about um, scarcity? Um, I, I was quite interested in the McKinsey report charting our water futures, uh, which um, you know I kind of expected it to be sort of a big rant in favor of privatization and so on. So I was kind of surprised when it wasn't that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Peter Gleick and others were involved in creating that. And there was, uh, I mean, for me as a non-expert in this area, it was interesting that it really it suggested that uh, the major issues around scarcity were to do with agricultural and industrial uh, water requirements and less with human drinking requirements and uh, uh, sanitation requirements. And, uh, you know, it, it was suggesting that, you know, the key solutions, if you like, the appropriate technologies were everything from sort of, you know, different mining technologies to, you know, different irrigation techniques and so on. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd be very interested in bo both of your takes on, on that discussion, uh, you know, with regard to the question of appropriate technology. Um, 
Would, to thoughts? me, it would be a, a matter of place-specific um, geographical unevenness to assess what's a genuine and what's a socially constructed scarcity and how we address it. I mean, what's the character of a mode of production in Johannesburg, biggest city that ha doesn't have its own river? Uh, the water table has been pumped out and is absolutely destroyed. It's by acid mine drainage, uh, terrible chemical and um, mining uh, residuals getting into the entire uh, table uh, and, and the surface water in Johannesburg. Even, even at the point where the, the crocodiles, hundreds, are actually going belly up in the Kruger Park, several hundred k's away, caused by the acid mine drainage, mainly of, of coal-fired electricity. These are things that I think we'd say, okay, that's, that's geographically specific. We identify the sources, and for especially the mines, let's ask the question, is it worth it to keep pulling this cheap, cheap coal out of the so soil, burning it, all the residues, mercury in the air and the water, just for some aluminum smelter that then produces Coca-Cola you know, cans. I mean, we've got to really rethink that. So to me, that's always going to be a specific question. I think where Peter Gleick, this is a, a, an institute, the Pacific Institute in, in Oakland, that's done such good work on generalizing and universalizing human and social uses. So Peter and I worked on the Johannesburg case, which we lost. But we also did something I hope you all will get a chance to see. It's uh, a little older than this cutting-edge exhibit. It was put out about two years ago, The Story of Bottled Water by the Story of Stuff Group. And that's the, one of the things we've been trying to do to say, especially in Durban at the COP17, no bottled water allowed. So we are looking for ways that that very, very small amount of water that human beings are using in relation to you know, agriculture is 52% in South Africa, much higher ratios elsewhere, where we can get that appropriate balance. And that does mean, I think it gets back to the question, what's a water right? And if it's 25 liters per person per day, which is what the, the government's decided, and the activists say, no, we want 50 liters, we want to flush our toilets four and a half times, <laughs> um, then that's going to be the next level of contestation. What we didn't do properly in that uh, that struggle over the, over the micro, over the household, was connected to the Sutu dams that provide the water, to the acid mine drainage, to the golf course and the swimming pool consumption, and to the disposal that gets into the Kruger Park. And that's what I think we've been learning is the need for this holistic, multifaceted way of looking at the hy hydropolitics. Mm -hmm. I hope you all agree as scientists and as social uh, activists. And one way or another, we're all going to have to talk together and link our issues and link our, our energies to solve some of these problems. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah? There's one just here. Yeah? Blue and then green. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, are in, in both the cases of the play pump and the sewage system, were those communities liked or was something being projected on them as a way of harming them? Um, well, um, well like, like by whom? By the rest of the society in general. Like, I, like, like that, that, I realize that, that sounds like a rhetorical question. I don't actually know. I mean, I'm just wondering, is it, is it well, something that was... Yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if you're talking about power and status. Yeah. I mean, those groups of people are people who don't have much of a voice or much power, which is partly why they could be, you know, suffering under this technology and yet it would still keep on getting installed mm -hmm. and people in other parts of the world would think it was working great. Mm -hmm. So how is it that those people's voices and experiences didn't count? So, yeah, I'd say that generally there's people who don't have much power. So, I mean, whether they like, I mean, I don't think they're disliked, but they just don't have much power. I just add that it's slightly relational, so that if you're getting a play pump instead of getting those water taps, um, the next village down does, because there's just some politician there that has more power, then that's going to factor in. And the urinary diversion, those UD toilets, are definitely seen as some kind of township, um, uh, non-waterborne, um, lower, lower quality, really neo-apartheid version of sanitation because it's well understood that the people that are getting these are so poor they just can't afford the water. And since we aren't putting these into wealthier people's houses, it's always going to have that effect. So some overarching equality, I hope, will ultimately change notions of what's acceptable, what's socially stigmatized, and what's actually environmentally sensible. But it's a long struggle. Thank you. Any further Questions? You're you're happy without asking your questions? Yes, we have a couple of, up, up at the back. Yeah. Thanks. And I suppose this is moving slightly away from the focus directly on water, but it's something that I think that underpinned uh, Patrick your talk significantly is the notion of neoliberalism. 
Um, and I was very interested there in response to another question that you said, well, what we need is a strong state, and um, a, but a strong but democratic state. Oh, sure, and I democratic. just wanted to see if I could push you a um, bit further on that, particularly in relation to how neoliberalism and all its complexities has been used um, as a, a, in concert with environmentalism, I suppose, as a, a solution to some of environmental challenges. And I'm thinking particularly, perhaps not necessarily in, in, in South Africa, but particularly in an Irish context where you know, the, the water charges, the smart metering is highly linked into environmental discourses. Um, but what we're finding in a research project that, that's exhibited here in, in the, the Surface Tension Exhibition is that people don't want to, to change and they vote for the governments. So if the government is saying we're going to be strong, but yet, you know, vote for us, they're not going to get voted for. And I just wonder if you could just elaborate a bit more, perhaps, on the notion of a strong but democratic state in relation to some of these issues. Well, if, if, if I apply those um, examples of state society relations you're, you're implying here uh, to South Africa, I just think of the struggle to get more free water and the knowledge that everybody has that's going to have to come through the state. Or, okay, look, there are anarchists and autonomous who are perfectly happy with stealing <laughs> the water, commoning it, right? So they are definitely about maintaining community plumbing brigades that go and dis reconnect illegally. So that's going on. But the vision to get beyond um, those sorts of responses which degrade the system, and especially electricity, and lead to electrocutions, those would definitely be about a developmental state with that sort of social de democratic um, overarching capacity. And that's going to mean not just the free water, but a luxury consumption tax that redistributes. I think that's the main point I get out. It may not work so well in an Ireland, but in a place like South Africa to really tax the hell out of those who abuse water and make sure everybody else gets the water has been a, a, an organic demand. It's about, it's about justice and, and equality and, and not abusing the environment. I do think, though, that where we've seen these struggles amplify to the point where governments get kicked out, and I, we think of Bolivia as maybe the most uh, uh, explosive example, the water wars and then the wars over um, hydrocarbons uh, that communities wage, that coca growers wage, that indigenous people wage, did bring to power a wonderful you know, indigenous president, Evo Morales. And I'm so happy that I can actually say today, yesterday I would have been confused, but today there's a lot more clarity, that the struggle that Evo Morales is going through over whether to actually betray his movements, who wanted free water and, uh, in Cochabamba, or wanted to, to keep the oil in the soil and the, leave the coal in the hole, or wanted to nationalize the, whatever hydrocarbon is out there. He was beginning to betray that, and there was a huge struggle last couple of weeks in uh, the Tipness area that led to uh, a, a big battle, really. And it seems to me that's the sort of politics we need to be paying a lot of attention to, where all of these big structural forces are precisely pushing even good states, good leaders, to become neoliberal and to uh, adopt the sort of extractive model if you're in a place like Bolivia. And it's really only the, let me call it a double movement. Karl Polanyi had this sort of sense that the market goes there and there's a movement back when people resist. And that's what we're going to have to continue building. Yeah, um, I think if I, if I take what you, for what you're saying, Anna, it's like uh, if you had one party that was saying, we will ration your water, and then you have another party which says, we won't ration your water, then people will vote for the one that says they won't ration it. And so how do you get to a state where, uh, where, the, where the state can impose those kind of restrictions? Is that, is that more or less? Yeah. Isn't it about the 99% that shouldn't be rationed, the 1% that should be taxed to hell? That's really the... Yeah, I, mean, well, I, think, I think it is a very complex question. I mean, I think it's a very in interesting one because, I mean... How is it that you have the Anglo-American model of hyper-individualism and there's not a collective sense of responsibility, whereas if you take some Nordic countries, there's more of a collective sense that it's not just about what you need, but what's for the social good. So where does that start with education or with communication from the government? Yeah, I think it's an interesting, interesting point. It's definitely a complex question. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, there's one, one more at the back there. Hi. Um, I've actually just come back from Lesotho um, within the last nine months, um, the country that sells jo or Johannesburg all its water. Um, the thing I was never comfortable with in that country was how, while I, on 
one level, water is it's the country's biggest export. Um, most of the people in the country still go without a stable supply of water. And I was actually there at the time when the country was facing or looking into one of the wor its worst uh, droughts in 25 years. Um, related to water pumps, um, I saw a number of the plate pumps that had been completely abandoned. In their place, there were, in a way, an improvement with some more backwards technology, gravity-fed water pumps, which seemed like a much more sustainable option. Uh, also, solar-powered pumps. But in both cases, there were still problems arising from, I think, p the poor design of the processes which brought those pumps about. In the case of gravity-fed pumps, um, it, it brought about some social conflicts between villages because there were conflicts over who was, uh, one village felt that the other didn't have rights to draw the water. With the solar, panel, solar panels, they were sometimes, um, uh, I suppose theft was an issue in some respects. Um, I suppose this just kind of reminds me of a kind of lessons I learned over there, which is in some ways, it's, it's frequently the case in development that old bad ideas very easily get recycled into new great ideas which become tomorrow's old bad ideas and it just keeps going around in a circle. So again, I suppose I just come back to the question um, on a practical level. When looking at bringing design uh, uh, or, or, or practical solutions uh, in cooperation with communities who are supposed to be the ultimate beneficiaries, on a practical level, again, what's the best way to go about that, or what, what kind of, let's say, advice to the development sector, to designers, could you, could you give? Well, um, yeah, well, thanks for that account as well. That's very, that was very interesting. Um, I think one thing maybe to, to keep in mind, there are, I mean, I could, I could recommend, for example, uh, Amy Smith, who's an academic uh, who works with co-design. I mean, there's a, there's a whole body of people out there who are taking appropriate technology and developing the methods by which you work with other work with users. So there's a big stream of knowledge that you can dip into there. Nabil Hamdi, who I mentioned as well. But I also think um, there's, no sil there's no silver bullets. And I think it comes back maybe to what Linda was saying as well about you know, bottom-up design and uh, can become an obsession in itself and a kind of a trend as trend too, a sort of a trendy idea that what we need is more bottom-up design. It is, it is a good principle, but it's also not going to be the only thing that solves the problem. I think well, your descriptions of what's happening in Lesotho are to do with so many higher level functions to do with the relationships of countries and how development happens. So, yeah, as I say, some great people working on u more user-led design, and that's really great to learn about. But we also have to look more widely than that as well. And I'll just say, I think, because the Lesotho case, it's so near to my heart because I, I worked so hard against those dams with a wonderful activist in Soweto who didn't want that water because they knew that it would put the price up beyond their capacity to pay. And I actually broke with Kader Osmo, right, this great name from Dublin, uh, as, a, as an advisor because he just kept pushing forward these big dams. And these are massively corrupt dams. The World Bank is you know, implicated in all kinds of messes there. They were apartheid dams. They involved a coup in, in uh, 1998. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Maluti bearded vultures sort of threatened species. We could go on and on about the problems, not just that the water is being drained out to Joburg instead of being used in Lesotho. And I think, I mean, you know, James Ferguson, this great anthropologist with his book Anti-Politics Machine, was so good in showing how up in those highlands of Lesotho, that state could go in with a road or the, the water technology then subsequently to his work um, that, that brings the largest cross-catchment water transfer in Africa, these Lesotho dams, to Johannesburg, and just such a mess is made. You'll remember at the end of that great book, The Anti-Politics Machine by Jim Ferguson, his Harvard PhD about Lesotho, he then says, well, what do we do? And the answer is simple. You've got to work with social movements. You've got to work with people on the ground who are really cross about this for very good, genuine reasons. And see if you can help, in the sense, technologists or academics here in Dublin, um, all of you who have a, have a bit more scope because you're seeing the world with all the technological advances you have, to try to connect dots and find what the kind of interests that drive things that might not be apparent on the surface. And so I really want to thank Ralph and actually Michael, the whole group of you that put this amazing exhibit, exhibit together. I learned so much in, in walking through it. So thanks for, very much for having me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there was uh, one absolute final question there, and, and that really is it. 
<laughs> How far are we away from an outright military conflict, just purely over water? I mean, Darfur, right? That's, that's the sort of first big story of a climate war because of the changing water patterns and the access of nomadic um, and, 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 and local uh, folks in, in, uh, in Sudan. But look, there are water wars that go back in history. I mean, there are huge projects of constructing major infrastructural, you know, the, the, the great uh, Roman water uh, aqueducts and all that always involved uh, war. It's a, it's a tremendously important uh, commodity. I guess what I'm um, interested in is whether in, a, in an Ishmael Sarah Gelden's warning to us all that the, the, the wars of the 21st century will largely be about water, whether we're going to be able to do the sorts of um, geographically specific technological uh, solutions in the case of Johannesburg, the biggest city in the world without its own water, just take it from Lesotho. And that's so wrong if it's being done without a change in the power relations that asks us, well, what is the agriculture in that area? Why is it sucking up all that water? What's going on with these mines? And those are the kinds of questions we're going to have to ask if we are really to avoid not just water wars, but, but people, as I've shown you above, that are, that are really dying because of lack of access to 25 liters a day. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your great questions and comments and personal perspectives. And uh, I'd just like to end by asking you to join me in thanking Ralph and Patrick for their inspiration and provocation. Thanks.